folks, and welcome or welcome back to NTI's Japan Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Ziv Nakajima, I'm again. And this podcast was brought to you, among others, by Emil Gorgis, a Tokyo real estate agent who specializes in serving international or mixed nationality families looking for the perfect family home. So Emil's an Australian. He's been living here in Japan for the past two decades, eight years of which he's been actively buying, selling, and managing real estate properties in the city on behalf of his own family and a great many happy clients. And he also acts as a mortgage broker on behalf of his clients. So his company has a dedicated loan officer in many of the Japanese mega banks. And if you're a regular listener, you probably already know him from our JREP, the Japan Real Estate Experts panel sessions. So you're probably already aware that the man is an absolute fountain of wisdom on all things related to real estate in Japan and in particular to family homes, the greater Tokyo metropolitan area and mortgages. And most importantly, he's incredibly generous with his time and advice, which he's more than happy to provide at no cost or commitment to anyone asking. So if you've been thinking about buying your home in Tokyo, but you've been sitting on the fence for a while, or if you just want to have a chat in English with a real expert, drop him a line on emil.gorgis, that's E-M-I-L dot G-O-R-G-E-E-S, emil.gorgis at tokyorealty.jp. Hit him up today and start exploring your options. All right, so for today's episode, this one should be pretty interesting for all of you uh, family or holiday home shoppers out there. We speak to Phil, an acquaintance of mine who's been living with his family here in Japan for quite some time. And Phil's a fellow property enthusiast, but as opposed to boring investors like myself and most of our investor clients, he's more of a lifestyle property buyer. And while he does occasionally run a nice little profit off the properties that he buys, he does seem to be a lot more interested in the search or the hunt, I should say, for attractive deals, the renovation or improvement or rehab of the property's personal use, and then potentially resale and maybe a profit down the track. So we chat a bit about his experience buying property in various countries, his life here in Japan, and then we dig into his family home that he's been living in for a good few years here in Kobe, which, spoiler alert, is now back on the market, um, about the market for non-standard properties, the challenges and opportunities inherent in those. So a nice casual chat, plenty of gems in there, and who knows, maybe even an opportunity for one lucky buyer. So lean back, grab a drink, enjoy the conversation, and I'll see you again on the other side. All right, Phil, welcome to the show, man. Great to have you join us today. Ziv, always a pleasure. Great to see you. Yeah, so well, we've actually met here in Fukuoka City a couple of years ago, and we've been in touch a good few years prior to that. So I know that you're definitely not new to the real estate game. Um, maybe share with the listeners a little bit about your um, personal story, who you are, what you do, how you ended up in Japan, and how you got involved in property. Well, um, I wound up in Japan about 10 years ago. I was living in South Korea, but coming back and forth to Japan, working as a baseball scout for a Major League Baseball team. And I met my wife that way. And also, I was in uh, teaching English, which I do now in the universities in Japan. Um, I was a mortgage broker years ago in another lifetime, and that's when I got into property. So I've been involved with properties for over 20 years uh, buying, selling, financing. Um, even though I'm not full-time in the game, I think it'll always be a part of my life. I just, I love being around real estate. And um, if I get it correctly from our conversation so far, you're not so much the investor, more, more the lifestyle kind of real estate buyer, right? You're um, opportunistic kind of, oh, I like this place. Let me see if I can set up a little home base. Is that is that about right? That's right. Yeah, I think it... it you know, I do have one investment property in Thailand right now. Um, with the market soft over there, there's a potential for another one. But yeah, um, I'm in it for the lifestyle. And I'm also in it for, I have a retirement home set up in Thailand as well. So I'd say I'm, I'm 75% lifestyle, 25% investor. So when you say investor, you're more into the um, potential resale, right? Not actually a cash flow rental investments, but more into buying and then selling at a profit? Right. I do have one rental property in Thailand, um, which is also my retirement home. So I, while I'm not there, I'm airbnb it out, renting it out. But eventually, if everything goes well, that'll be my retirement home. 
Um, but yeah, the home in that we have now that I live in in Kobe, that's for lifestyle. That's for living in. So how, how did you end up in Kobe specifically? And, and what exactly did you buy there? So basically, we wanted to buy a home in Japan. Uh, you know, I was sick of renting and living in a shoebox. I wanted to live like a human being again. <laughs> so I told my wife. <laughs> and um, I love Nagoya. I have great friends there. I used to work there. But that city gets really hot. The air quality is not great. And I grew up on Long Island. And I've lived in Huntington Beach, California. So I'm more of a beach, outdoorsy person. I love being by the water. And Kobe is like San Francisco, Seattle, except at a fraction of the cost. I cannot afford those cities. Um, my wife and I were looking around with a realtor about four or five years ago. He kept steering us towards new construction, you know, 30 million and up. And, oh, you can get a mortgage and this and that. Uh, we, we really were not interested in, in that. We were interested more in rehabbing, which a lot of people, as you know, don't do in Japan. But as a foreigner and an American, you know, we do this all day long. And I know that it's not very popular in Japan, but it worked out for us. In fact, the property that we wanted that I really liked, um, the realtor kind of made up a white lie, we think, and said, oh, no, that property is not sold. It's unavailable. My wife had the intuition to say, well, let me call the listing agent directly. She did. Sure enough, the property wasn't sold. And it's a, it was, now it's 43 years old, um, but we saw it had potential. It had good bones, great view. So we were like, um, yeah, this, this has potential. And my wife had the uh, wherewithal to say, hey, upstairs is where the view, at, the view is of the Akashi uh, Kayo Bridge and Awaji Island and Osaka Bay. Why don't we knock this wall down? There were two bedrooms up there, tatami rooms, and make this an open floor, floor plan. We'll have our living room up there and our kitchen, and we'll build the, the bedrooms downstairs. We'll turn the kitchen into a bedroom, which we did. It's a playroom. The living room is now my oldest, eldest son's room. And then we took the tatami room downstairs and we put, put a wall up. So now we have four bedrooms. So we, we totally revamped the inside. Uh, we also put in a nice veranda. We updated the other veranda and just really um, took advantage of the views. Like um, the views that we have, you're probably looking at it in like San Francisco Bay Area, something like that, millions of dollars, right? So yeah, yeah we, we were like, this is for us. Um, and luckily, you know, my wife's Japanese, um, she did think I was somewhat crazy for wanting to, to, re to renovate, but she got it. Uh, a lot of people in Japan don't do it. Um, there's various reasons. I hope they do because there's just so many homes there that can be renovated, that can be uh, reconfigured to have awesome views. Um, so I hope that's like we, you know, we inspire some people. Yeah, I think um, in Japan, the thing is... Um people kind of think it's, oh, it's such a professional job, better leave it to the experts. So the real estate companies, like we occasionally buy properties for our clients from real estate companies that actually specialize in renovation and they do some phenomenal work, but you're right, for the average um, Joe or, or, or Mr. or Mrs. Watanabe, I think they say here is, um, it's mind blowing to just, you know, to think about the fact that you can actually do this kind of project yourself. But it is, it is amazing and it looks amazing too. I mean, people watching the video are probably seeing photos of the house now or if they're um, listening to the podcast, we should be able to put it in the show notes. It's really a spectacular innovation number that you've done on this one. So is, is that kind of what you've been doing with other properties as well in the past? You find something that for one reason or another is uh, in a location or has some features or has the interior that maybe makes it a bit less desirable for say your average buyer and then you can have it at a large discount and put all of those dollars into renovating it making it more desirable is that what you do regularly no we just hit a home run and we retired after this one <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but we i've i've actually pointed some friends in that direction some homes you know we looked that out in the countryside and a friend of mine from thailand came you have to have the right person, though, to rehab it, right? Um, you mentioned that the real estate companies will do it, and, and most people in Japan um, really haven't been accustomed to this. It's not really part of the culture. 
we were lucky. We ran across a friend of ours introduced us to a man who's American and has been in Japan for 30 years. And he's a contractor and he speaks Japanese and he reads, reads and writes uh, Japanese. So we were really lucky. He has a Japanese crew. He can, he can, he's a contractor. You have to have the right person um, on board with that. You can get a Japanese contractor, but I would check out at least three people. The, the person we got was a heck of a lot cheaper than what the Japanese contractors wanted to charge. Okay, well, don't be, uh, don't be shy to uh, give him a shout out by name. We can also put his contact details sure. in the show shout notes. Out to, shout out to James Dobson, who's uh, in the Kansai area. Um, and we could, yeah, I can give you his phone number and email address. And uh, great guy, reliable, and like I said, it, uh, bilingual, can, he saw a vision right away. He came in, he's, yeah, and he checked the house. He, before we bought it, he checked it for us. He ran all sorts of lasers and checking out the levels and the foundation and the wood and the flooring and everything. So uh, I don't think home inspection is really much of a thing in Japan, as far as I know, before people buy. I think actually it would be, you know, if I were to stick around in Japan, that would be a, a market that maybe you want to get into is home inspection uh, with this, getting a contractor in there, getting, I don't even know if there are home inspector licenses in the States, before somebody buys a house, they're going to get a home inspection on it. They're going to pay whatever it is, four or $500, but they're going to get an honest opinion on whether this house is good and, or if it's problematic or if it's somewhere in between. It's, um, it's definitely done here. It's done usually by architectural companies. I don't think there's an actual uh, specific license for it. We do it um, on behalf of a lot of our clients, especially when they buy uh, something a bit older, second home, um, like you did in your case. Um, they def it's a bit pricier here, though. I think it's about between 1000 to 1500 bucks uh, mm. to get a structural inspection. And even that doesn't include the roof. If you want to get the roof inspected, that's a bit extra. Um, but it is done. But you're right. It's done more by foreigners than uh, Japanese. I think maybe because the Japanese don't tend to buy very old houses. They usually like the newer. And then there's probably less of a need for that. Um, okay, so was this one, was it, uh, don't get into actual prices, but it was, was it expensive? Was it cheap? Was it a bargain because of some certain aspects of it? What was the deal there? I think we got a fair price on the house and we got a very, I think we had a very fair price on the, the remodeling. So James, not only, as you can see in the pictures, remodeled the inside where it's basically like a Western style with hints of Japanese in it. But he also retrofit the walls and the ceiling and made the made it made made it a much stronger, safer home for us. We have two little ones, uh, two boys, four and seven. At the time, we had, our youngest was an infant, and our little guy was like three. We want to make sure this is a safe house. This is not just us. Um, down the road, uh, like you mentioned, a real estate company came in and rehab the house and all they did was wallpaper the walls and paint the outside and stuff that there was a similar structure to ours there was no retrofitting or nothing like that so if you are this is a good message for your listeners buyer beware make sure if they did rehab the house or, or remodel it did they retrofit it if it's an older home because up until 1980 or you would know this better than me there were there were no laws for for earthquake proofing or not proofing but strengthening your home for an earthquake i believe now it's called retrofitting where they go back and tear down the walls and go in and make make the make the uh, structure stronger we interrupt this broadcast i always wanted to say this we interrupt this broadcast to tell you about tokyo family stays they're a short-term rentals company in tokyo and they offer a home away from home experience which is just perfect for remote working quarantining or if you just need summer quiet to hide away from the world. So they offer a variety of options for families, for corporate relocations, or simply if you're transitioning between homes in Tokyo. Now the properties are super comfortable, tastefully furnished, fully equipped with all amenities, and they accommodate up to 10 people. So really the only thing you'll need to bring with you is your toothbrush and maybe a change of clothes. 
They've got fast, unlimited wireless internet, dedicated workspaces, and fully equipped kitchens. And they're just a delight to stay in, a fantastic alternative to Japanese business hotels, which if you've ever stayed in one, you probably know they're tiny, they're noisy. Fine for a night or two if you're on your own, but long term or with a family, you'll probably feel you're in a jail cell very quickly. So if you want to give yourself a sense of space and freedom by renting a real home with comfortable Western beds, including all the necessities like baby bedding, children's toys, high chairs, you definitely want to reach out to Tokyo Family Stays. They've been at it for over a decade. They're a fully licensed minpaku or short-term stay operator. And as a special bonus for our viewers and listeners, they're also throwing in a breakfast basket upon arrival for anyone who books and mentions the Japan Real Estate Podcast or NTI. And not only for guests, if you're a property owner, you've got an investment property that you want to tweak for higher profits or a holiday home that you want rented out when not in use via short-term stays, drop them a line today, see how they can help you maximize your property's income. And again, as a special bonus to our viewers and listeners, they're also offering a free audit of your existing short-term stay listings without any obligation whatsoever. So feel free to reach out to them at tokyofamilystays.com. Well worth your visit. And again, if you're in the market for a family home in or around the Tokyo metropolitan area, Emil's your man. Don't be shy to reach out to him as well at emil.gorgies, G-O-R-G-E-E-S at tokyorealty.jp. Yeah, I'm not sure for wooden structure, for concrete structures, it was 1981, June 1981, that was uh, when the new um, earthquake resistance standards came in. For wooden houses, I think the year there was a bit different, but yes, there is. there are definitely some um, some new standards in that way, and they can be retrofitted. So was this one... Um, was there any aspect of the house? So I, I know the views are spectacular. We can see that. Um, but I think the street is uh, uh, no access or no parking street or something of that sort. Yeah. So that, that's one of the um, challenges that um, if you have a car, you're going to have to park a few houses away and probably pay about each amount a month, about a hundred us dollars. Um, there are other parking lots around that are even cheaper. But for us, you know, we don't have a car. We use Times Car Rental, or Car Share when we need to, oh, yeah. which is a service. You, you, same? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we just pay per 15 minutes and go to Costco once a month and that's it. Um, so that, you know, that's one of the challenges is there's no parking. The other one is it's there's not street access. But if you have kids like us, we think that's good. Because you that have to walk good. downstairs or walk upstairs. And then if you walk upstairs, there's kind of like a dead end there, sort of like a cul-de-sac. And some of the kids in the neighborhood play there. So if you have kids, I think it's it's better to, to not live on a street. Uh, I have I've have several friends whose kids have gotten hit by cars in Japan. The roads mm -hmm. are so narrow. It's hard to see. Uh, things like that. Um the other thing that we talked about, I think that you have mentioned, is the house cannot be torn down. You can rehab it. I believe you have to leave part part of the structure up. But again, we've retrofit this thing. The roof has been uh, looked at. Um, it's probably you know good for another forty or fifty years. This house, it, I would say at least. Yeah, and I think with the rebuild legislation too, as long as you leave the base, uh, the concrete base, and maybe um, just the start of the walls around it, you can pretty much rebuild it, uh, but it's considered a renovation. So that that's pretty easy to get around. Right. Okay, so I mean, we, we've spoken to a few people in the past about uh, houses like these that can't be rebuilt, or in other cases, uh, the Jugo book and the... Um, the houses that had some incident where somebody um, somebody you know committed suicide or was murdered, all of these houses for various reasons are sold a lot cheaper usually than your standard houses on the market, and that's because the average again Japanese buyer wouldn't want to buy into them for one reason or another. But for a lot of foreigners that I speak to, that's actually a strategy. There's money to be made there. So you're buying cheap, you're already making money just by virtue of, you know, paying far less, whether it's cash or mortgage payments or whatever applicable rent you would have paid to live in a place like this. But then how about potential resale value down the track? So if you're buying these unique properties, you can sell them, but you obviously need to find the right kind of buyer. Like you've mentioned, somebody that actually doesn't mind not having a car or somebody who sees the potential in these assets, right? 
Yeah, or somebody who wants a vacation home. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the, the, let's just put it this way. Down the street from us, there's a brand new house about the same size. It's, it's pro, you know, they probably paid 30 to 35,000, uh, uh, sorry, 30 to 35 million yen for it. We're asking uh, about 13 million yen for ours. So the only difference with them is that they have parking. You know, it's a newer home. But as you know, in Japan, once you turn the key on the on the house, the value usually dips. It's not it's like the land, yeah, yeah. It's not like the states, and especially now where it's going crazy. Where typically, historically, it appreciates over time. Europe, Australia, it's different. So, um, if you don't want a big mortgage and you can finance a house for yourself, uh, this is perfect thing. We didn't want a mortgage. We we paid uh, cash for this house. Uh, we pay cash for the renovation. And then think about it this way. For all the years we've been living in this house, we've been paying no mortgage payment. So we're saving $1,000 to $2,000 a month, you know, uh, uh, 10, uh, what is it? 100,000 yen to 200,000 yen a month. Our taxes are about, what, three or 30 or 40,000 yen a year? I mean, that's yeah, insane. That's three, New homes, bucks I was looking to, uh, at. Yeah, sorry, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, no, I mean, I was just looking online the other day at new home prices in, in Las Vegas. You know, you bought them, the, the base home, just the starter is going to be $350,000. And your taxes are going to be 1% of that, $3,500. So if you want to save a lot of money, which we have by not having a mortgage, mm. it's Perfect. a little bit old, older. Perfect. Yep. And you're selling it for 13 million, about 130,000 US, which is unbelievable price for a holiday home. Yeah. 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 Holiday home or, or live in it and not, not have, you know, if you can uh, pay cash again, you won't, won't have, you won't have a mortgage um, on it. You, you'll save a lot of money that way. You know, as people get into their forties and fifties um, in Japan, uh, they have to start thinking about retirement. And one of the things, one of the reasons why I wanted it, and I didn't want a, a mortgage is because I know that when I retire in Japan, uh, I'm not going to get much of a retirement, not much of a pension. So I have to self pension. So if I, if I buy a house and have a mortgage on it, I'm paying 200,000, maybe 250,000 yen a month on it, where with this, I'm all that money is now going towards my retirement. Yep. retirement really yep. hung up after they retire and have really nothing so um think about that too retirement you want to put your money into a house into a mortgage and a house that's going to depreciate or do you want to put your money into a house that's paid off and then whatever you you make each month you know aside from your expenses you can save absolutely retirement. so why 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 are you selling it by the way well, it appears that some opportunities, several, are presenting themselves back in America um, okay. and uh, probably going to go for it, you know, in the future. So we're just kind of positioning ourselves and getting ourselves ready for that so, exit strategy. So no more beers in Fukuoka for a while? Well, I'll we'll be back, you know, <laughs> occasionally, a couple, every couple of years. i to get you over to the States. Or, you know what, Ziv? You and I have an affinity for Thailand. I have a feeling we're going to I think, meet up yeah, there. That, that sounds our... like a plan, definitely. Um, it, it's actually looking like borders are finally opening up a bit. Um, you know, a couple of tests, a couple of days quarantine, but it's looking a lot more achievable to actually go on holiday for a change. So, yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so hopefully we might have a list. I've read this. For you. Sorry? Yeah. So, so, no, yeah, I just I recently say... read that they're going to do away with the tests in Japan. With the tests oh, as well. In, in Thailand altogether. Yeah, it's it's gonna, they're basically going to open up like the way they they were before because I think Cambodia has gone back to that and some other neighboring countries and yeah. So they just so, want what proof of uh, vaccination? Uh I don't know. I, the headline was like they're doing away with uh, testing. So so I have to look into it a little bit more. But um, that's what the rumors been recently that yep. they're going to do that and do away, you know, like 
pre-pandemic, just come and arrive and that's it. Because a lot of people were turned off by um, having to test when, before they left, when they landed and showing proof of vaccine and also taking out an insurance policy. Yeah. Yeah. I can't wait. Okay. Um, I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, if we have somebody who's listening, who's in the market for a super affordable, super attractive home in Kobe, and I mean, as a foreigner, I can definitely see the, the attraction. I mean, you've kind of, like you were saying, James Do Dobson, was it? Yes. So the renovation there is like, it makes it just perfect for a large family or an entertainer, somebody who has people over for barbecues or, or an evening at home. Um, it's very much a foreigner kind of renovation, right? And the, um, the views, the living area, the dining area, the balconies is just, it's a very indulgent home, isn't it? You, you don't, the, the view never gets old. And we have rainbows. I mean, the, 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 what do they call it? The magic hour at like 5 p.m. The sunset, we, you get to see the sunset every day. It's just, it's breathtaking. In the room, the, the home gets so much natural light, especially upstairs. You don't even have to turn the heat on half the time in the winter. It warms up so nice. Um, we've got shades if you want to take them down uh, and, and avoid the heat. Um, the bathroom, you see, you know, you mentioned is pretty, it's very Japanese. We do have the waterproof room and the, the, the heated tub and all that. And then the, uh, the separate uh, little washroom there. And so there's like, there's, I would say it's, it is foreigner, definitely a lot of foreigner influence, but some Japanese left in there as well. Yeah. No that's, tatami that's, matters. Yeah. For anybody who's, okay. You know, sorry, you know my that <laughs> and that's my wife's call. Actually, I wanted to keep this beautiful wood carving up. No, 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 it doesn't fit. It's it's not. <laughs> this is modern now. I wanted to keep one room with the no. Nope, that's no. Nope. My wife doesn't want to talk. She's Japanese. Apparently, they're a lot of work, and you have to replace them every few years. Yes, but I mean, the good side is if somebody does want to install them, I think um, they're only about $1,000 per room or something. Then it's not a huge expense. So very welcome to put them back in. All right, brilliant. Um, thank you for coming on the show, telling us all about it. Um, I really hope we can help you um, and one lucky buyer introducing the home to them uh, here on the show. And I know you've got a professional foreigner friendly realtor on the job there as well. So this should make hopefully the process, uh, the purchase super easy for anyone who is interested. Um, okay, so we, we don't know when yet, but um, best of luck on your uh, next chapter of that life's uh, journey, yeah? Thanks, Sev. Yeah, we're gearing up for it. And uh, if you're in Kobe, please stop by. We'll have you on the deck for a barbecue. I might. I might. I'm actually thinking about a, a trip to Osaka for a customer and thinking about taking my son with me for uh, Universal Studios and whatnot. So um, Kobe is definitely in the card soon. Come on by. Brilliant. Well, good luck again, and um, thank you. Speak to you again soon. Thanks, Ziv. So there you go. Nice, friendly chat. Hope you found some value in it. And if you happen to be in the market for an extremely affordable holiday or family home in Kobe with some fantastic renovation work and spectacular views, Kobe is one of Japan's best cities to live in, by the way, hands down, probably second only to Fukuoka. Sorry, Phil. So do feel free to reach out to us either in the comments section or wherever you might have found this episode or via email on info at nippontradings.com and we'll put you directly in touch with the realtor handling the sale. Now, before we go, we're also, as always, going to tell you and also link to our other sponsor's website. That's Hiroshi Shimizu, immigration lawyer and administrative scrivener. If you're thinking about moving here on a more permanent basis or you're already in Japan on some sort of a temporary visa and you want to switch to a longer term or permanent one, or if you're considering setting up a local company or a branch office of a foreign company and you've got any sort of business or visa related inquiries, or even if you just want to find out what your options are on any of these topics, feel free to contact Hiroshi Shimizu. You can find him at japanimmigrationexperts.com and he can help you set up a company, apply for any kind of visa, or just provide you with the best advice and extremely affordable consultation related to these topics. And he's already done that for many of our listeners. So feel free to reach out to him. Again, that's japanimmigrationexperts.com and you'll be well on your way. And that's it from us for today, folks. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Japan Real Estate Podcast. 
do share it with your networks and please let us know what you think so leave us a short rating or review on the iTunes store on Spotify or just drop us a line in the comment section or wherever you might have found this episode we love hearing from you hope to have you with us again next time and until then have a great day or night ahead you